Thank you. And again, I'll uh, start with a few slides and hopefully use the board, especially if you ask me questions. Uh, so I want to say a little bit about the Z2 phases, the quantum spin Hall effect in 2D and the topological insulator, 3D topological insulator in 3D. Uh, and then so far, we've all mostly been talking about non-interacting tight binding models, at least Titus and I have. And I would like to say quickly why we believe that in most cases, it's not that hard to generalize these topological phases to interactions and disorder. You've already heard about uh, disorder a bit from Alex. Uh, and then I want to launch into electromagnetic response and insulators. So this is where I ended last time. So I said, we're going to use spin orbit coupling to make topological phases. And this originally grew out of making two copies of the integer Hall effect in sort of opposite directions. Uh, and then I'll show you a tight binding model in a second, which was historically important. Uh, it was used by Kane and Malie to sort of explain what aspects of this new phase, the 2D topological insulator, are similar to the quantum Hall effect and what's different. Um, but the idea before them was that maybe if you make a nice but somewhat fine-tuned model, you could get an edge state where, say, spin up goes one way and spin down goes the other way. But the concern was that once you add disorder and realistic spin orbit coupling, then up and down will mix and this will not be very stable because we had no topological reason that this was protected. And in particular, the churn number that is our main topological invariant so far, as a little exercise, you can show that that's always zero if I don't break time reversal symmetry. While uh, this term, this spin orbit coupling is present, it, it is allowed by time reversal symmetry. So we'd like to find a new topological invariant that could be there even in systems that only have spin orbit coupling no broken time reversal. Um, so the reason why this was called the quantum spin Hall effect historically was this doesn't have a Hall effect of charge because the two directions cancel out basically. Up spin would give me a Hall effect one way, down spin the other way. Uh, but if you define a spin current, if you assume that spin was a good quantum number, then you would find that this state did have a quantized spin Hall effect. But again, that isn't exactly the way that spin really works. Uh, but there is something about this physics that survives. Um, and that, I want to maybe historically say how Kane and Malie figured it out. It was basically by playing around with the model that was originally introduced by Haldane, which is very similar to what Titus just showed you. It's a model for the integer quantum Hall effect on a lattice. Uh, Kane and Malie basically made two copies of it and did some numerical playing around at the level of like Mathematica, not very fancy numerics, and notice something interesting. And then they figured out the cause of something interesting. Uh, the interesting thing was that basically this boundary state is unusually stable as long as I respect time reversal symmetry. And the reason is that there's a topological invariant in time reversal invariant systems, but it's not an integer like churn number. Uh, there are only two possibilities, odd or even, plus one or minus one, zero or pi, uh, there are different notations that people use, but they're always just two choices. So I'll call that a Z2 invariant. Uh, so I want to sketch why, just from basic properties of spin, should you believe that there is an odd even effect in time reversal invariant Fermi systems. And then I'll be very quick about uh, Berry phases and how this can be seen, because I want to focus a bit on 3D, uh, where the Berry phase expression, for example, is more elegant. OK, so the idea of what Haldane did, and I'll give you his model in a second, was uh, make a lattice model that would be a, what we now call a churn insulator. It would have bands with non-zero churn number. Uh, it's just a very simple two-band model based on graphene. And then Kane and Malie said, well, let's take two copies of that, one for spin up and one for spin down, and think about what spin orbit coupling does. Uh, but if I don't turn on if I turn on a simple form of spin orbit coupling, I can build a model exactly like this, and then I can add more realistic spin orbit coupling and see if it's stable. That was basically their approach. And I should, to give credit, uh, this was an example, maybe the, the best known example of something that realized separated up and spin, up and down spin, moving in opposite directions. Okay, so their model, first, this is uh, the Haldane model to start with, is based on the graphene lattice which will model just as tight binding on the honeycomb. Uh, so if I just had this term, I would famously have Dirac cones, and it would be a semi-metal. Uh, 
And the nice thing about a semi-metal with point Fermi surfaces is that it's pretty easy to open up a gap. And there are various different ways you could open up a gap. So let's think about different ways you could open up a gap in graphene. And the simplest is forget about spin, forget about time reversal and things like that. Graphene has two inequivalent sublattices. Uh, if you want, there are the, let's say the A sublattice is at the left end of a horizontal bond, and the B sublattice is at the right end. And I could add a potential that is different on A and B. And for example, this is what happens in boron nitride, which is also honeycomb lattice, but boron and nitrogen are just different atoms. And if you add this, you get a big gap, and that gap has nothing to do with spin. Let's just call that ordinary band insulator. So nothing very mysterious. This is just an easy way to open up a gap from the Dirac nodes in graphene. And if we put the Fermi level in that gap, we have an ordinary band insulator. So the first term uh, that Kane and Malie added was just making a version of the Haldane model. So let me explain this. Uh, so there's an I, which would break time reversal, but it's multiplying the Z component of spin. So this is a form of spin orbit coupling. It's a little bit artificial because it just involves SZ. Uh, but if I fix spin up, say, then this first term, what it would basically look like is a magnetic field on the lattice. It's kind of an alternating or staggered magnetic field with zero flux overall. The notation is that Vij is related to the sign of the cross product of the two vectors that I move along to get from I to J, where I and J are next nearest neighbors. So in the lattice, the old Haldane model from 88 or so was constructed using second neighbor hopping and a funny magnetic field to get non-zero churn number. So if I just added this first term, that would be like the models that people had discussed before. It would be separate, spin up, and spin down. And I would have a band which has, say, churn number plus one for up and churn number minus one for down which is compatible with time reversal. And then the playing around they did was to add this other kind of spin orbit coupling, which is not there in suspended graphene, but it would be there if you put graphene on a substrate, for example, so-called Rashba spin orbit coupling. And this now involves all three components of spin. So the point is, if SZ is a good quantum number, I can still talk about the churn number of upspin and the churn number of downspin, and those have to be opposite, and they have to add up to zero by time reversal, but churn number is still a well-defined concept. With this, it no longer is, so I need to think of something else. And the idea is, that going, to, is going to be that even when this is present, there's a kind of Z2 invariant. Uh, and I'll sketch a simplified version of their argument for why that's true. Um, so just to explain the claim, even once I violate spin conservation, once there's no component of spin that commutes with the Hamiltonian, Time reversal is still a good symmetry, and that gives me a new kind of protection. And I'll draw some pictures to illustrate how it's different from the protection in the quantum Hall effect. Uh, so just to explain how this is related to the churn number we talked about before, if I had something like a component of spin that would break up electrons into two flavors up and down, then I could define something like spin churn number, uh, where the total would be zero, but spin up and spin down, each separately could be non-zero. And this is what would happen in that two copies of the Haldane model. But this all disappears. Uh, and what you get is that now every pair of bands, in the presence of spin orbit coupling with time reversal, bands naturally come in pairs. They have Cromer's degeneracies at points in the Brillouin zone where k is equal to minus k. Anyway, then every pair of bands has a z2 invariant instead of every band having a z invariant. And again, just like before, if I have a bunch of occupied bands, I add up their Z2 numbers. And that tells me whether I'm ordinary insulator or topological insulator. So that's kind of the, the mathematical analysis. Let me draw some pictures. Um, and this is where we're going to use the property I told you to think about last time at the end, which is that time reversal acts in a funny way on spin half particles. As a result, I always get two-fold degeneracies. And just from that, you can understand why there are Z2 topological insulators. That's going to lead us to the idea that basically, even if Anderson was right and a quantum wire is unstable to localization, half of a quantum wire is stable to localization with time reversal symmetry. So what's half a quantum wire? Uh, this is the idea of what does the edge of this quantum spin Hall state look like? And let's say I'm going to draw it with up and down, but 
all I need is there's one right moving mode and one left moving mode. Solid circle means I put an electron in the state and empty circle means I don't. And the point is if I've just got a gap in the system except at this edge, so these are the only gapless states in the system, then think about time reversal. This is my right mover, this is my left mover. This state must be the time reversal conjugate of that state because there's nothing else at the same energy. And then if we believe Cromer's, if we believe that these pairs always exist, then in a time reversal invariant system, then time reversal invariants cannot mix the states in a pair because then it would split them uh, in perturbation theory. So in other words, any time reversal symmetric perturbation I add, like disorder, modified spin orbit coupling or whatever, cannot produce that kind of backscattering uh, because it would violate Cromer's theorem. It would split the Cromer's pair. So this is really the key difference between the Z2 topological insulator and the quantum Hall effect. In the quantum Hall effect, like the case with churn integers, there are only right movers, say. There are no left movers. So there's just nothing at low energy to backscatter into, at least nothing extended. Uh, and at the edge, really, usually nothing. Um, here, there is something that in principle I could backscatter into if I bounced off a phonon with inelastic scattering or something. But at least time reversal symmetric elastic scattering, it's really the symmetry that keeps me from having backscattering. So how is this compatible with what Anderson told us about localization in quantum wires? Well, the answer is if I take something like a carbon nanotube, that always has an even number of right movers and an even number of left movers. This process is still forbidden but I can scatter from the right mover to the left mover that is not its Cromer's pair, that is not its time reversal conjugate. So that process is allowed. Likewise, going from what I've called down to down is allowed. So we believe that if I start with any even numbers of Cromer's pairs and I turn on disorder, they will eventually, whoops, localize away. Well, if I start with an odd number, I might lose some pairs, but I'll never lose the last one. And that's really the Z2 invariant. And the key point is this only worked because of time reversal. If I was allowed to break time reversal, if I put on a magnetic field or something, this would become allowed, and neither one of these is stable. Then the only invariant is churn number, and churn number was zero for the states I'm talking about. So I'll give you in a minute, uh, when I talk about 3D, I'll give you a nice Berry phase expression, because you might be wondering, uh, with churn number, you can sort of see how maybe an integral will always give an integer. Uh, how to get an integral that always gives just two possibilities is a little tricky, but you've actually seen a clue in the previous lecture. Uh, so I'll come back to that, but for now, let me not give a Berry phase expression in 2D because there are different ways to do it, but it's a little complicated. Let me just go to 3D. Sorry. Yeah. Your, your right here is not time um, that, that, that is allowed by time reversal. Uh, so. Remember, uh, time reversal keeps me from scattering a state to its time reversal conjugate. It doesn't keep me from scattering, like I, I'm assuming that spin is not a conserved quantum number. Uh, the only symmetry I'm respecting is time reversal. This state, it is the time reversal conjugate of that state, so that X process doesn't happen. But nothing actually forbids, so for example, suppose I had just potential scattering with no spin component. Then I've got a right mover with spin up, and that hits a potential, if the potential has nothing to do with spin, that will scatter into a left mover with spin up. Uh, so you know, you'd have to worry about momentum conservation maybe, but if I've got a disordered system, there's no momentum conservation. So I think this process is allowed uh, even with time reversal symmetry. The, the check is allowed, but the cross is not. But if you disagree, we could talk later. Okay, so um, anyway, this was seen experimentally. We have a nice, uh, we have a representative of the group that saw it experimentally, so I'm gonna skip over that. Uh, there's happy Lorenz Mullenkamp was the first one to see the state. Now there are other materials like maybe tungsten ditelluride. Uh, so I'll skip that. Um, so 3D, uh, there is kind of an historical way to get the 3D topological insulator just from what you know about 2D. I'll sketch that very quickly because I want to write uh, maybe a more modern way of getting the 3D Z2 topological insulator. Uh, but let me sketch sort of history and what the, why it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so let's first think about the quantum Hall effect and churn number. So suppose you want to make a 3D quantum Hall effect. That would be nice. Well, we think that the only way you can do it is really to layer the two-dimensional state. So you could you know, make 
a bunch of quantum spin hull, sorry, quantum hull layers and stack them up, and you would have an edge that's a so-called chiral metal. Uh, mathematically, we'd say there are three churn integers in 3D. One is from stacking XY planes, one is from YZ planes, one is from XZ planes. Or if you want, these are three different planes in the 3D Brillouin zone that I could integrate to get churn numbers. Now, the interesting thing that happens, uh, there's a fourth invariant when I think about Z2 invariants, but I, it's more complicated than the 2D invariant because I have to use both up and down spin. I can't really view it as two copies of the 3D Hall effect the way I can sort of view the 2D topological insulator as two copies of the 2D Hall effect. And let me sketch uh, one way of deriving that and then talk about a more modern way in about 10 minutes. Uh, so I think the way it was originally done was the following. If I think about the 3D Brillouin zone and think about time reversal, let me focus on XY planes for the moment. There are some planes that are different from others because only some planes are taken back to themselves by time reversal, which takes k to minus k. So for example, the kz equal to zero plane, that gets taken to itself by time reversal. So that's like a two-dimensional time reversal symmetric problem, which means I could define a z2 invariant for this plane. I could also define a z2 invariant for the top slash bottom plane, because this gets taken to itself under time reversal, plus pi over a and minus pi over a are the same thing because of periodic boundary conditions. So there are two planes that are special. And the interesting case is that in between, you don't have time reversal in the same way because time reversal takes you from minus kz to plus kz, which is really different. So that allows the following possibility. Basically, you could define a z2 invariant for this plane, and you could define a z2 invariant for this plane, but in between, by breaking time reversal, you might change the Z2 value, which is not defined in the middle. You could go from ordinary here to topological there, or vice versa. Uh, so that means, to start with, you'd think there might be six Z2 invariants, because there'd be two XY planes, two XZ planes, two YZ planes. With a bit of lifting, uh, with a bit of work, you can show that if you do this interesting property of changing the z2 from here to there in xy, you also have to do it in the other two directions, so you can reduce the number of invariants from 6 to 4. But this is uh, tedious, so I'm not going to go through it for you. Instead, I'll write down a nice integral later on that is exactly the fourth, the so-called strong topological invariant in 3D. Uh, so this was uh, a way to do it that just builds on what we know about z2, but hang on for a more berry phase way. But uh, physics-wise, the signature of this invariant is very clear. So think about what happened in 2D was that we could understand the Z2 invariant by looking at the edge, and we said that half of a quantum wire is stable, even though a normal quantum wire is not. Well, in 3D, the analogous statement is that half of a metal is stable, half of a normal 2D metal, but not a normal 2D metal. Uh, so what do I mean by half? Well, in the simplest cases, in some of the materials that Claudia told you about, for example, uh, the surface of this 3D insulator looks like a single Dirac fermion with the Dirac point at gamma. Um, and when I say single Dirac fermion, I mean even including spin. So by this counting, graphene has four Dirac fermions because it's got both K and K prime. It's got two different Dirac points in the Brillouin zone, and it's got two spins to a good approximation in each K. So here I've just got one Dirac point and one spin. Uh, there's kind of a locking of spin and momentum. And in real experiments, the spin is more perpendicular. So don't take this picture too seriously. Um, and this is something you can look for in photo emission. Uh, and as was already shown by Claudia, uh, it was seen even in old materials like bismuth cellulide, where, selenide, where people thought for 50 years that they understood this material. And it was an insulator with a band gap from here to there. And then you look in photo emission, and you see that there are states in that gap, and those states even look like the Dirac cone. And one reason why these 3D topological insulators 10 years ago were sort of exciting, maybe they still are a little exciting, was uh, this is not a big energy scale by materials or semiconductor physics. But if you come from quantum hall like me, uh, you're used to maybe one Kelvin energy scales in a typical quantum hall experiment. 0.3 EV is more than 1,000 Kelvin. Uh, so all of a sudden, you know, you're no longer stuck at dilution refrigerator temperatures and so on, uh, and you don't even need magnetic fields. The material is just sitting there topologically waiting for you to measure it. 
So that was kind of nice, historically. Uh, so now, you might be a bit nervous so far that we've all been talking about band structure and tight binding models and so on. But you probably know that the real world is not tight binding models and things like that. So a clue that the physics we're talking about is really beyond band structure or not limited to band structure is experiment. So I showed you the quantized Hall effect is quantized experimentally to one part in a billion. And certainly that's happening in a big chunk of material with defects and interactions and so on. So uh, we'd like to understand, are things like the integer quantum Hall effect and the Z2 spin quantum Hall effect and so on, are these really stable to disorder? Um, and are they stable to interactions? And the good news is, for some of the topological phases, there's a neat trick to just reinterpret the topology in a disordered interacting system. And that proves that the idea of the phase is stable. So I'll, I'll give you that trick. And then I'll draw a couple of pictures for why disorder is actually important uh, in understanding experiments. And in fact, you wouldn't really see nice quantum Hall plateaus and so on if you had a perfectly clean system. You need a little bit of disorder for things to work out OK. So here's the little trick. Uh, and I can draw a picture to go along with it, maybe. So the top line is what you've seen already, which is let's integrate the churn form over the Brillouin zone and get how much does that band contribute to the Hall effect. So now I want to think about a different experiment, but let me explain why it's a generalization, why the bottom formula is going to be a generalization of the top one. So what does K do in the Hamiltonian of a tight binding model? So if you remember Titus's lecture, uh, when you add K, it's like some of the matrix elements in your tight binding model, like the ones in particular that take you from this unit cell to the next unit cell, those pick up a phase, and that phase depends on K. So in a tight binding model, the way that momentum enters is very closely related to, uh, depending on your convention, it may be exactly the same as, if I've got the unit cell I'm focusing on, then every process that would hop me to the next unit cell, for example, if this is what it was doing naturally, let's say that these are atoms A and B, we call it B prime, then I transform it to this, but with a phase that's related to I and then some function of K, uh, depending on spacings within the unit cell and so on. So, what we're, another way to think about this is this is as though I thought about my unit cell as a torus, and every time I move around the torus, I pick up a phase which is related to K. And that's what uh, New, Thales, and Wu, a couple of years after that TKNN paper, said, well, let's write a version of our topological invariant. So same topological invariant, still churn number. But instead, I want to think about this kind of picture, where I've got a black box of material. It might be disordered. It might be interacting. It might be big. It doesn't have to be a single unit cell. But the way that I think about this working, I should think about it as living on a torus. And every time I go around one of the non-contractible circles of the torus, I pick up a phase. I'll say one of the phases in the x direction, say, is theta, and the other one is phi. And then I can make a topological invariant, which is how does the ground state of the many body system change under these phase twists? So if I've got a non-interacting system, if I've got Slater determinants in a crystal, then this will reduce to exactly the sum over bands of the one electron churn numbers. This is saying there's a many electron churn number, and that will be an integer in an insulator. As long as I preserve a band gap and have a non-degenerate state, that will be an insulator, and it's still just how much the insulator com contributes to the quantum Hall effect. Uh, so in basically one line and one picture, their paper argued. And if you want more details, it's a PRL, I think, from 1985. Um, but they said, well, at least for the quantum Hall effect, we can go from this to that. For, for Z2, it's actually a little bit more tricky. And I'll give one way when I talk about the magnetoelectric effect. But this is formally, at least, a way to handle disorder and in interactions. Um, so you can do this numerically and so on. Let me draw a picture of what disorder actually does, and that will explain why it's important for experiments. Uh, let me go back to the previous slide. So 
For the Z2 invariant, one minor technical comment, you can handle disorder with exactly this trick. To handle interactions, you need a little bit more, um, which the magnetoelectric effect will give us for 3D. Okay, so what does disorder do that is good for us, actually, in the quantum Hall effect? Uh, and I also want to explain how you can recover the Landau level picture from lattices, if you are interested in that. So suppose I took flat bands or Landau levels to start with. Then if I were to look at, on the horizontal axis, the density of states, on the vertical axis, energy, for the Landau level problem, I've got energies like this. And, well, let's think about when we would see the quantum Hall effect. Uh, it turns out that this situation is a little bit pathological because when you see the quantum Hall effect is when Landau levels are completely filled or completely empty. Like if the Fermi level is there, for example, then I would expect to see nu equal to one. I would have filled one Landau level and have one be entry. But this only happens for one very fine-tuned electron density, because the moment I add one more electron, I've started to fill up this level. I'm inside that level, which is metallic. And the moment I take out more than one electron, I'm inside there. So what disorder does, which is helpful, is it actually makes the density of states finite. It smears out these delta function peaks. Let me try to draw it in a more symmetric way. Um, so now there are actually states at all energies in the lab, uh, but these states in between Landau levels are localized. In fact, there is, we think, in a large enough system, a delocalized state only at one sharp energy. Um, so the density of states becomes non-singular. Uh, so what were delta functions are now just bumps. Uh, but there is still something singular if I look at how localized are the states. And that formula, we have very good numerical evidence for this in the non-interacting case. To understand it analytically is surprisingly non-trivial. Uh, let me define the localization length, just how large is a localized state of electrons. Then this seems to go as the distance from the critical energy to some power nu, where nu is roughly 2.35 are the latest numerics. Uh, and, and the numerics are all on non-interacting systems, while the real lab system, of course, is experimentally is, uh, interacting. Anyway, so the point is that there uh, survives, if you like, the way we would look at it topologically is there's a whole bunch of states in a large finite system, if I do this trick of thinking of a large finite system with flux twists, there's one state here, say, with churn number one, there's another state here with churn number one, and all the others are localized states with churn number zero. And that's kind of how disorder actually works. Uh, but the good thing about disorder is because you have this reservoir of localized states, that means that for some finite range of electron densities, you still have the same topological property and that's why you need disorder for your quantum Hall plateaus to have finite width in density. Um, so one more thing I want to say on the board before we go to 3D, uh, and please ask questions. Uh, I, yes? Uh, uh, can you see, I'm just curious about stabilization length, the square equal exponent. So you say it's numerical, but without interaction, so it's not possible. Can you recover it in experiment as well? Uh, that's a controversial subject. There is at least one experiment so to be precise, experiments measure the combination uh, nu z, but it seems like z maybe is equal to 1. z is so-called dynamical critical exponent. There is one experiment that shows scaling consistent with this from Dan Sui's group. Uh, and there are a lot of experiments that either don't show any good scaling or don't show this number. So I don't, it could be that that one, I mean, that, that's a very respected group. You know, Tsui has a Nobel Prize and everything. So it could be that that's the best experiment. Or it could be that this is somehow very difficult to see so I don't think the experimental status of this quantum phase transition is perfectly agreed on. Good. Other questions? Then I want to say, uh, how do I, since I gave here the effect of disorder in the Landau picture, how do I get disorder 
in the Thalus picture, well, maybe the easiest thing to do is let me explain how the Thalus picture becomes Landau levels if I have a certain limit. Because I said this in words, but I find it useful to think about. Suppose I took the square lattice tight binding model. Uh, let me make, it, make my squares more similar. <laughs> so uh, then I've got uh, hoppings to start with if I had no magnetic field. And let's say they're all T. Uh, this would have a pretty simple band structure that you can calculate for yourself. So now I want to put on a magnetic field. And I'm going to put on a magnetic field that has a certain flux phi per unit cell. So I can do that by modifying these hopping elements. It should be that whenever I circle a flux, for example, if I hop around that unit cell, I pick up a total phase that's related to, that is phi, uh, phi over phi naught, phi in units. So I'm going to assume that phi is put in units of the flux quantum. Um, so I guess the phase should be 2 pi if phi is equal to the flux quantum. OK, so one way to do that would be to take all of these bonds, which I'm going to write with one arrow, and say that arrow means that my phase is t now e to the 2 pi i phi over phi naught. I'm going to take all of these horizontal bonds and give them two arrows. Two arrows means t e to the 2 pi i 2 phi over phi naught, and so on. And eventually, this is where one technical assumption you need for the TKNN formula that I didn't really mention before comes in. I'd like to assume that phi is a rational multiple of phi naught. Let's say that phi is phi naught over q, q an integer. Then by going up q original unit cells, I can make a so-called supercell, and I still have blocks there. Uh, if I took an incommensurate flux where, this wasn't, where it wasn't rational, then strictly speaking, I wouldn't have blocks theorem, and I'd have to do something else. Uh, of course, we think that eventually, if you can handle a problem for all rational fluxes by continuity, you probably understand the problem. So that's why we don't regard that assumption as a big problem. But anyway, now you could ask, well, what does the band structure look like? Suppose I took q equal to 5, for example. What does the band structure look like? And my argument is going to be that as q gets large, this becomes exactly what we think of as Landau levels. So that's why if you understand something for Landau levels, you don't need to modify it too much, even in a crystal. OK, so what happens? Well, at q equal to 5, I've got energy. And really, I should draw kx and ky for you. But since I'm not going to actually do any calculation, let me just call it k. I'll have some bands. I've now got five sites in the unit cell, so I should have five bands. And with a bit of work, you can do this in Mathematica and compute the churn numbers of these bands, and you'll find that they look like the following. So they add up to 0. They satisfy that rule I told you before. And the low-lying ones are plus 1. Then there happens to be one bigative, big opposite churn number band around 0, and then more plus 1s. If I took q goes larger and larger, at least for q odd, the same pattern applies. These get flatter and flatter, and they have churn number 1. And those just become the Landau levels. So in a sense, you could view the Landau levels as the small flux limit of hopping on a crystal. And that's why Landau levels work, even if you're in a real solid. So when people do experiments on gallium arsenide or something, there is a crystal lattice there. So why are you OK with ignoring the crystal lattice and just using Landau levels? One way to look at it is, is precisely for this reason that if you ask in a typical quantum Hall experiment how much flux is there per unit cell of gallium arsenide, the answer is really small. Uh, you could convince yourself of that because the magnetic length is like a fraction of a micron, which is much bigger than a unit cell. So anyway, that's why Lando levels are just the small flux limit of Thales. So you could view Thales as generalizing Lando levels. OK, so now I want to get on to 3D. I think that, that those are the last things I can say about 2D. Um, and in particular, it turns out, painful as it is for a condensed matter person to admit, particle physicists knew a lot about the 3D topological insulator without knowing what they were talking about, really, in the 1980s. Uh, but it's kind of amazing 
They didn't know about tight binding models and band structure and so on, but they knew about one very important aspect of topological insulators, which is what's their version of the Hall effect. So for example, with the quantum Hall effect, you can ask what's quantized, what could you measure in the lab that tells you you've got a topological phase? And the answer is the Hall effect. That's why we gave it that name. Uh, what could you measure about the 3D topological insulator, say, that lets you know you've got some interesting topological phase? So it has a metallic surface, that's true, but it's not obvious what's quantized about that metal. Um, spin transport is complicated. So what should you measure in a 3D topological insulator to know that it's special? Uh, and I want to warm up for that by saying a few more words about polarization. Uh, you've already heard a bit. One reason for talking about polarization is that it's also useful for thinking about metals in a way. It's a useful warm up. So we're continuing on our uh, list of what Berry phase is good for. So the claim, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a second, is that electrical polarization of a 1D crystal is just the loop integral of A over the Brillouin zone. Uh, so this is A, the Berry connection. And A at a point is not well defined, but loop integrals of A are almost well defined. The almost, I'll come back to in a second, but this was already kind of important. It took about 50 years of wrong efforts to calculate polarization of a solid just by trying to figure out where charge sits in the unit cell and realizing that depends on how you define the unit cell. This is actually what you have to look at to compute polarization of a crystal. And why this works, I'll sketch in a second. Uh, if you want kind of an intuitive way to at least remember the formula, if you plugged in something like e to the i k r, you would get r out of this, the position of the electron, but that's sloppy. Uh, the real way that this was derived by Thales, and then it was generalized by Vanderbilt and collaborators, what happens when you, suppose you have a crystal, and you start to change the crystal a little bit, you move the atoms around or something like that, the way that polarization changes is that a current flows in the unit cell under a change, and that change of polarization being related to current through the unit cell, that's how you derive this formula. Um, and I'm not going to say too much about it, but one key aspect of this formula, which you already heard from Titus, is uh, it has an ambiguity. It's not perfectly well defined. It's actually ambiguous by an integer times charge. So I'll try to remind you of why that's true and why it's OK, because that ambiguity uh, is good if you want to get a Z2 invariant. Um, so the property of that integral, loop integral of A, is that it's not totally invariant. It's under some gauge transformations, it will actually jump by NE. But we think that's physically correct. And it's related to the notion of pumping, uh, here called Thoutless pumping, which is changes in polarization are changes are induced by changes in the crystal, and they produce a flow of charge. I can have changes where I basically change the crystal in a cyclic way and come back to where I started. And in that process, I've shuttled one electron from the left edge of the material to the right edge of the material. That's Thoutless pumping. Um, so let me draw a picture. Suppose I've got some unit cells of a very large crystal. So Thales' idea was that the change in polarization is the integral of a current in time from an adiabatic change of the crystal. And then by sitting down and computing in perturbation theory and getting rid of a denominator, very much like they did for the TKNN formula, what you get is this relationship between polarization and A So P, we're claiming, is some E over 2 pi loop integral of A dK. And first, where does this quantum come from mathematically? Uh, the idea is, suppose I took A goes to A plus grad chi, 
That's the change in A induced under a change of the wave functions where chi is the phase change of the wave function. It appears like e to the i chi. OK, um, and I, I didn't put a vector sign on A because we're just in 1D for this formula. Um, so if I do that, well, what happens to P? That means that P prime, if you want, so A makes that change. This is now plus an integral that is not necessarily 0. So if I've got E over 2 pi, integral over phi, grad k, dk, where grad is just partial k chi in 1D. So OK, you say, well, this should be the difference in chi between the beginning of the integral and the, phi and the end of the integral. But now, remember that chi is just a phase. So chi, in the process of going around the Brillouin zone, chi doesn't exactly have to come back to where I started. It can come back to where I started plus 2 pi n. So this is p plus e over 2 pi times 2 pi n, where n is the winding number of the gauge transformation. And the term large gauge transformation means a gauge transformation that is topologically non-trivial. That's what this is. So that's P plus NE. So that says polarization is only well-defined up to an integer addition. And the reason why that was true was, mathematically speaking, there are large gauge transformations in 1D for, this is a U1 gauge, since pi D U1 is pi 1, the group manifold of uh, S1 is the circle, so that's just Z. So the fact that that's not 0 means that there are gauge transformations I can make that are like circles. They have a winding number. And if I do that, polarization shifted. And that is the statement that I could have a continuous process in the crystal that brings me back where I started and shuffles a charge from the inside to the outside, which is very much like the Laughlin pumping I drew before. So why is this good from the point of view of Z2 invariance? And this is uh, just another way to look at an argument that you already heard. Because we're going to use this to analyze what does inversion symmetry do in 1D to polarization as a warm up for talking about 3D in a second? So, this means that if I had a material that I thought of as zero polarization, I should really not think of it as zero, I should think of it as the ladder of integers. So, zero polarization. That means P is equal to NE. Or it's basically this ladder, 0, e, 2e, minus e, minus 2e. And that is symmetric. So inversion inverts polarization. That would be logical. So this ladder is symmetric around 0. But there's another possibility, which you could call pi polarization. And that would be the latter, say, 3 halves e, 1 half e, minus 1 half e, minus 3 halves e. So that latter is also symmetric around 0. Uh, if I took any one particular value, it would not be symmetric. But the totality of values is symmetric. And that's what you've already heard is, a, if you want, the simplest, the 1D example of a topological insulator protected by inversion symmetry would correspond to these half integer values of polarization. So my reason for repeating this is that the key to the 3D topological insulator is to do the same thing in dimension 3 instead of dimension 1 and to think about a slightly different quantity. So, uh, John, yes. I mean, a bit philosophical, but you are, you are selling us an observable, it's peaceful, expectation value of some operator, right? Uh, which shows non-invariant these are large gauge transformations. Okay. So now I could object that this is a bit worrisome. And I mean, if we write out your A 
You know, I can tell you, let, let me just tell you what I think the answer is, which is, if I give you a crystal that, you, that has boundaries and that you can observe, that uniquely picks out one value. So if you want, I would say, if I only give you a unit cell, if I don't give you the boundaries, if I just give you the unit cell, then there is an ambiguity, basically, in how you terminate. Uh, yeah. And so just one unit cell is ambiguous. A finite sample with boundaries, there you could measure the surface charge, and it's no longer ambiguous. So the ambiguity is just because if you only have one unit cell. Doesn't satisfy no. periodic. I mean, you, you write um, block functions and d by dq expectation value essentially. That's what you're doing, right? And d by dq is the position operator, uh, and the position operator just it, it's, not, it's not a periodic operator by itself. I mean, you cut it short. I mean, um, uh, there is a suggestion to that one should think of this as an exponentiated of some the, the exponentiated. Uh, uh, um, and I'm wondering. Just well. Okay, I mean, that, that, that would be like, okay, but I, I guess I put it this way. I think that this ambiguity has a physical meaning, which is that you could give me a crystal yeah. with, suppose you give me a crystal with zero polarization, and then all of these are different physical ways to terminate the crystal. If you want, they differ by how much charge did I staple on the ends, or alternately, once I took the zero, say, suppose you gave me one that we all agreed on was zero polarization, Dowless pumping is a real physical process that I could use to make the others. So I think, I mean, I think these are, each of these is a real physical state of the system with boundary that are all achieved from the symbol. For, for a given crystal, I mean, just sitting there, there might be an issue, but uh, if you consider the equivalence class of crystals. Yeah, I would say if you, if you consider the equivalence class of crystals that only differ by, the, by physics confined to the boundary, uh, then that, that's where the ambiguity comes from. And then specifying the boundary result, and you'll see how this, my, my picture of how this works in two more dimensions in just a second. But it's a good, it's a good point. And if you want, uh, there's a new book coming out by Vanderbilt that has the best, it's in proofs now, and it has the best discussion I've seen of, the, of why this is a physically correct definition. So. Um, okay, so and one mathematical object, so I've used this term churn simons a couple of times. So here, uh, we said d equal to one, a was, related to polarization, d equal to 2, f was our churn number, that was IQHE. Well, I told you that in d equal to 4, there's also an IQHE, and people, it turns out that that's related to f wedge f, or in other words, epsilon f i j f k l, which a mathematician would call the second churn form. And the same way that f is equal to dA, there's an object whose exterior derivative is f wedge f. Uh, this is d of a dA. Uh, in d equal to 3, there might be something interesting related to polarization about a dA, which mathematicians call the churn simons form. And let me tell you now, this is a little preview, how that turns out to be true, but just from physical considerations. So how did people like Wilczek think about topological insulators back in the 80s just in abstract terms. And this is going to be the answer of what's the electromagnetic response of a topological insulator? It turns out it's a kind of generalization of polarization. Yes, I'm being a little sloppy. Yes, I need, there's also a part which is commutators of A, so yes. Uh, no, actually, it's going to come from the non-abelian part of the band structure. You, you need that, yeah, so. Okay, so this is a sketch. It is really the churn simons form, but the full expression uh, has also some commutators of A with A. Uh, I might have that later on, or I might have simplified things. Okay, so what Wilczek pointed out was the magnetoelectric effect of a crystal, at least part of it. So we kind of know that when we go into a crystal, we can modify the dielectric constant, we can modify the magnetic permeability. His point was, if you go into some crystals, it's been known for a long time, that you can produce a magnetoelectric effect, which is you apply an electric field and you produce a magnetic moment. You apply a magnetic field and you produce an electrical moment. So that would be terms like E dot B, E cross B, and so on. 
So E dot B of all those terms is pretty special. It's a total derivative. It's actually a total derivative of abelian ADA, um, which is going to turn out to be useful. So my notation, when I have uh, Roman letters like this, that means electromagnetic fields. And when I've got script, that means later on uh, Berry phases. Anyway, so Wilczek's point was that E dot B, naively, this breaks time reversal and it breaks inversion, because E is inversion odd and B is time reversal odd. Um, but his point was that this is actually like what we said about polarization, in that the coefficient in front, if you're only talking about the bulk of a material, like a unit cell, and I'm kind of translating what he said in a condensed matter language, but if you want the original paper, it's a PRL from 87, there's really a sense in which the coefficient in front is periodic. It's periodic and it's odd under time reversal. And those two ingredients are enough to give you something like a Z2. So the same way here, just the fact that polarization was periodic or ambiguous by a quantum and the fact that it was odd under inversion meant that we had two inversion symmetric classes of insulators, zero polarization, pi polarization. Wilczek's point was in 3D insulators, we should have two kinds of materials. We should have theta equal to zero materials and we should have theta equal to pi materials. And we now think that's true, and those are just the ordinary and topological insulators. So one way to look at what's special about a topological insulator is that it's got a quantized value of E dot B, and it's electromagnetic Lagrangian. And that sounds crazy, so let me try to sketch to you why this is true and not even that surprising, given what I've already said about 3D topological insulators. So what I said about a 3D topological insulator so far was that it had an unusual surface metal, which had a single Dirac cone. In general, to be more precise, I should say it has an odd number of Dirac cones. So that's when it's metallic. If I can make it insulating by perturbing the surface with a little bit of magnetic field or something, then I want to argue that it, it corresponds exactly to theta equal to pi. And the reason is the following. I told you that E dot B is a derivative of ADA uh, for electromagnetism. And what does ADA mean physically? Well, if you take derivatives, a term like ADA means that if you apply an electric field, you get a current perpendicular to it. It's exactly the electromagnetic term of a Hall effect. So in other words, to say the material has E dot B in the bulk is nothing different from saying that its surfaces have a Hall effect, and the magnitude of the Hall effect is related to theta, but in exactly the way that surface charge is related to polarization. Uh, so basically, if I had a normal insulator with theta equal to 0, then its surfaces if they were insulating, could have zero sigma xy. But I know that I could add stuff at the surfaces and make sigma xy equal to any squared over h. Uh, if you want, I could glue on additional integer quantum Hall layers, which is just like over here, I could go from 0 to e to 2e to so on by adding extra charges at the boundaries without modifying the bulk. So if I've got a surface Hall effect, the way, if you want a picture for why that's like e dot b, Suppose I had my surfaces, I apply an electric field, that makes a current that runs around the sample that gives me a magnetic field. So that's why having a surface Hall effect is enough to induce an E dot B. So for this to be consistent with what I said before about the 3D topological insulator, then something weird has to happen. It has to be that a material with, say, one or an odd number of Dirac cones, if I could make those cones gapped and get me into a quantum Hall phase, it should not be integer Hall effect, it should be half integer Hall effect. And is that true? Well, there's a theory calculation you can do, but here's an experiment on graphene that strongly suggests that's true. And this is one of the ways we knew graphene was Dirac cones experimentally. Um, if you look at the integer quantum Hall effect in graphene, you see a weird pattern. You don't see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 times e squared over h. You see a pattern which is like minus 6, minus 10, Sorry, minus 10, minus 6, minus 2, 2, 6, 10. So why those numbers? Well, graphene has four Dirac cones, and in the non-interacting limit, they're basically independent of each other. So divide by four. And this is minus 5 halves, minus 3 halves, minus 1 half, 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves. So that says that one Dirac cone contributes a half integer to the Hall effect. So that's why, uh, if you like, this is consistent, this definition, which is to say that a topological insulator is something where if I could gap the surfaces would have theta equal to pi. That's how that's consistent with saying if I don't gap the surfaces, it's a half, it's an 
odd number of Dirac cones. And finally, pursuing this argument gives you what I think is the first use of the non-abelian part of the Berry connection. So to kind of summarize what I said, that's equation one and equation two. Uh, this is saying that something I can measure in a material, which is the magnetoelectric effect, uh, is quantized in a topological insulator once I gap the surfaces. So once I make it fully insulating. And it leads you to a better, it's actually harder to compute than what we had before, but uh, it's at least mathematically more elegant and more familiar to field theorists. A new way to write what is the topological invariant in terms of the Berry phase. So now this script A, that's the Berry connection. And now this should be the non-abelian Berry connection. So I didn't write upper indices, but the second term is the one that Alex was wondering why I didn't write here. In the abelian case, this wouldn't be there. In the non-abelian case, it's there. Anyway, this is saying that it actually matters. I take all the bands that are occupied, and I think about even the off-diagonal matrix elements of the Berry connection, and I calculate this object. This object, uh, I'm going to claim, is an integral that is ambiguous by 2 pi n in the right units. Uh, it, anyway, this is an the precise value of the ambiguity depends on how you define the coefficient in front and how you normalize things. But this is ambiguous under large gauge transformations in exactly the same way as polarization, except now they're 3D gauge transformations. So just like polarization in 1D, this is something where I could get, if I get theta equal to pi, then different gauges would give me minus pi, minus 3 pi, et cetera. And if you want to know why there are large gauge transformations now, well, this is non-abelian, so I'm thinking about SUN. I'm in 3D, but a little fact is that pi 3 of SUN is also Z. Um, so if maybe for SUN, well, every SUN contains an SU2, and SU2, you could see that, because SU2 is basically like S3 with a finite identification, and finite identification doesn't matter for the high, higher homotopy groups. Uh, so anyway, this is why there are large gauge transformations. So everything in 3D is like everything in 1D, but more complicated. And the reason why this was kind of important, so this is just more about the non-abelian Berry phase, aside from being one of the first cases where the non-abelian Berry phase matters, this is really the first time it led to the first explicit formula for magnetoelectric effect in crystals. So some very old property that people didn't know how to compute because basically people weren't really thinking in this topological language. But every time someone has measured a magnetoelectric effect for 50 years or so, they've been measuring both an ordinary piece and a geometric piece. And all that happens in topological insulators is that the ordinary piece drops out and you're just left with the geometric piece. But in general, they're both always there. Uh, so one quick comment on how maybe people should have realized this in the old days and how E squared over H is a nice combination, and then I'll be done. Polarization in 1D, the quantum is E. In higher dimensions, it gets a bit messy because the quantum of polarization is determined by adding one charge per unit cell at boundary. Remember, polarization always has the units of surface charge. So surface charge, that's units of E per transverse unit cell area. So that's messy. In a crystal, there is, in a sense, a unit or a natural value of magnetic field, which is one flux per unit cell transverse area. So that's H over E per transverse unit cell area, which means there's something magical about this magnetoelectric effect ratio, the change in polarization from a magnetic field. All the non-universal stuff drops out, and the quantum of magnetoelectric effect in 3D is just E squared over H. And one reason why I emphasize this is that no, no statement here actually depends on being non-interacting. So you can use the magnetoelectric effect if you like, as long as charge is well-defined, as long as you don't have some unusual fractionalization or something, it's a proof that the 3D topological insulator still remains well-defined in interactions. And it says that E squared over H means something in every dimension. Uh, in 0D or 1D, it's kind of the quantum uh, of conductance, the famous contact resistance in 1D. Um, in 2D, it's the Hall conductance. And in 3D, it's the magnetoelectric polarizability. Uh, but E squared over H always winds up being special. And I mention that because in lecture three, we should get a different quantum that is the natural quantum for nonlinear optics, we hope, although no one's measured it. Uh, so hopefully, you'll show up for at least part of lecture three. I think that's it for today. Thank you. <laughs>